I think a good place to start when we frame the discussion around the safety of GMOs is, is realization that man has been modifying crops from the very beginning of time. In fact, this chart shows you where all crops started. And what you see is there's very few crops in the United States that actually started in the United States. That means everything we grow today came from somewhere else. Soybeans came from China. Lettuce came from, uh, from Asia. Uh, corn came from Mexico. And they were all genetically modified to fit here in the US to produce the crops we have today. And it's really a pretty good thing, because if you see on the picture here, you know, the ancestor of corn did not look like a very big corn plant, or I'm not sure you would want to eat that ancestral banana. So these improvements have given us better foods, better nutrition, and better, uh, better health. And the point is, you know, from the early days of hunter-gatherers to today's modern plant breeder, what we've been doing is, is genetically modifying crops, using techniques like mutagenesis, like cell fusion, techniques that worked, but but weren't very precise. And now we have tools like using the GMO tools, using the gene editing tools that are specific to the gene and literally down to the individual nucleotide in the gene. And so there are uh, they're, they're, they're ways that allow us to, to breed and improve crops uh, more, uh, more specifically. And, uh, and that's key. Now, when we talk about GMOs, we're going to spend most of the time today talking about the agricultural applications. But the point I, I want to make, and it's so key, GMOs are being used across the healthcare industry, across the crop and food industry, and across so many of our, uh, our, 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 the products that we use every day in our lives. The first GMO product, do you know what it was? Human insulin. It was approved in 1982. Prior to that, if you were a diabetic, the insulin that you used came from the pancreas of a cow or a pig. And it had problems with, with contamination and allergenicity. Once scientists were able to clone the human gene and produce modern humulin that's produced in a laboratory, it changed how medical treatments for insulin were delivered. And today, Half of the new drugs that are developed in this country are based on GMOs. Uh, you know, Embril, if you have arthritis, is a GMO product. Herceptin is a great cancer therapy that's used. And so the point is, GMOs and biotechnology have changed medicine. Uh, they've had a huge impact in food. Do you know what the first food product of GMOs was? Take a guess. Cheese. The enzyme that we use to make cheese is chymosin. That's the enzyme that cleaves the, the milk protein and turns it into, uh, into solids. Chymosin used to be extracted from the stomachs of animals. Today, that gene is cloned, it's made in the laboratory, and almost all the cheeses that we eat around the world are, are GMOs and produced with that product. And the vitamins that we use today are produced in the laboratory, you know, sterilely under great conditions and food ingredients. And then some of my, my favorite ones, and these may not be the, uh, the most profound, but are, uh, are detergents. The reason we use small amounts of detergents today and we can wash our clothes in cold water is because they contain GMO enzymes, proteases, lipases that literally lift the dirt off of our clothes. And you know, one of my favorites and in my office, you see these fish? These are glowfish. You can go to Petco or any of your, uh, your pet stores and literally buy GMO fish that now contain the fluorescent protein engineered into them from algae or from coral that makes them glow up in different colors. And of course, we've got you know, the impact on agriculture, which has been you know, by far, I think, the, one of the most impactful and also the most controversial. Today, th since 1996, there's been 100 GMO products approved around the world. They are now grown in over 30 countries on about a quarter of the world's uh, farmland. And it's been one of the fastest adopted uh, you know, technologies in the history of agriculture. And we think about it from a farmer perspective, farmers all around the world are using this technology. And it surprises people to know that this technology has as, had as much benefit to a large farmer in the US or Brazil as it has to farmers in India and Africa. And in many ways, the small farmer, the smallholder farmer gets even more advantage because they don't often have the access to the products to control insects and weeds that a, a large farmer in the US would. 
And over 90% of the farmers in developing countries represent the, the bulk of the farmers using the, uh, the technology. Here in the US, about 90% of our corn, our soybean, our cotton, our canola crops use the GMO technology. And I often get asked, why do farmers use this technology? The answer is real simple, because it works and it provides them benefits. There's been a recent study done by two German economists that reviewed all of the data from all of the sources. It was a huge meta-analysis. And basically, they concluded, and as you know, the, 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 German, the Germans haven't been the most friendly to, to GMO technology. But these economists concluded that, uh, that GMO crops have increased yields by about 20%. They've reduced pesticide use by over 30%, and they've increased uh, farmer profitability. And that's really one of the reasons that, uh, that we've seen such, uh, such dramatic adoption. The last point I want to make is, you know, on the science side, is these benefits ha have really, you know, addressed, you know, helping farmers produce more food, safer food, and, and better food. But uh, I think the, the statistic that I am most proud of is the fact that this technology has had a stellar safety record. And safety actually starts at the beginning of the discovery process. We know the sequence of that gene specifically. We can characterize and understand it. And every step in that development process is geared towards safety. From the time we discover a gene to the time we commercialize a product takes about 13 years. Uh, and we spend about $150 million. Here in the US, the GMO crops are regulated by all three government agencies, EPA, USDA, and FDA. You know, back when the technology was first being developed in the 80s, there was a prevalent view that this technology was so safe there should be no regulation. And then there was another view that said, this technology was so scary, we need to create some super new agency to do that. I think the compromise that was developed in the Reagan administration to create the coordinated framework, where they draw upon the expertise of the USDA in agriculture, the expertise of the FDA in food and feed safety, the expertise of the EPA in the environment, has actually worked out remarkably well. In many ways, it's been the gold standard of the industry. Now, you're going to hear that that process can be improved, and I would agree. Frankly, I think after 20 years, it can be streamlined and made better and more efficient. But the key is, it is very science-based, and it's the model for the rest of the world. And the other thing you need to understand is that because the US, because Brazil is the breadbasket for the world, and our grains are shipped all around the world, this technology is also reviewed by 70 other countries. There are ministries of health, there are ministries of the environment, and, uh, and uh, the ministries of agriculture. This is by far. These seeds, these GMO food products, are the most thoroughly studied food on the planet. And because of that, these are the safest products you know, that are in the market. In 20 years that these products have been used, since 1996, there's not been a single food or feed safety issue ever associated with the technology. It has a pristine track record. And that reflects not only you know, the inherent safety of the processes used, but the fact that there's been excellent regulatory review and, uh, and oversight. Now, the last point I would make, and, and one of the things you will hear often as criticism of GMOs, and, and it, it's interesting, is that no matter that we've had the great regulatory, we've had the great track record, you know, this is inherently not safe because you know, we're moving genes between species. And, and it always has to be uh, questions. And, and this is kind of interesting because in the last few years, from a science perspective, as we've studied now the genomes of all the crops and all the plants and animals, and we understand really at a natural, deep level the gene composition, what we've basically learned in the last few years, and this is new, that nature herself turns out to be a very good genetic engineer. So if you just take an example, ferns. How many of you have a Boston fern? You've seen them. The Boston fern gets its genes for light sensing from a moss. The genes have moved from moss into the, uh, into the ferns. The yew tree down here, you've all seen yews. Yews became really famous a few years ago because they were the source of Taxol, an important drug. The Taxol biochemical pathway in the yew plant came from a fungal organism that moved its genes into the yew tree. My, one of my favorite examples are sweet potatoes. How many of you eat sweet potatoes? My wife loves them. 
It turned out just last year that scientists who sequenced the, uh, the sweet potato genome realized that all sweet potatoes contain genes from bacteria that were actually introduced in the sweet potato using the same agrobacterium that we use to create GMO soybeans and corn. And here's the last kicker. The human genome has been sequenced many times, our genes. And if you take a look at that, uh, there was just a paper published three months ago. On average, humans contain hundreds of genes from other species. So here's the whole point. What we thought 20 years ago was, was, was exciting, scary, new science has turned out to be basically horizontal gene transfer. Uh, and it turns out that nature is a very good genetic engineer, and frankly, that genes are constantly moving as part of the evolutionary process and part of the improvement process. Now, I've talked a lot about the, uh, the science, and, and it's really important, but I need to change gears here and just make the point that, uh, that as important as science is, science, uh, science isn't enough. You know, it has to be strong, it has to be great science, but, uh, but that's not sufficient. We have to be able to communicate science to the public better than we are today. You've probably seen this, uh, this National uh, Geographic uh, headline. I, uh, I think it's a great, uh, it's a great article, um, the book. I don't disagree agree with it, but I don't like the premise. It says there's a war on science, and the, and the words you can't see here in, in the captions are, you know, climate change doesn't exist, evolution never happened, the moon landing was fake, vaccinations can lead to autism, and genetically modified food is evil. I don't think it's a war on science. I think it reflects the fact that the gap in science between what's possible to do and achieve and what the public understands and is comfortable with, we haven't addressed that gap very well in this country. And I think, frankly, it starts with more STEM education in our schools, but, but also, very importantly, we've done a lousy job of communicating about science and the importance of, of, of innovation and what these technologies can do. And, uh, and that's been the key. In fact, the Pew study you may have all seen that was published that compared the view of the public to the view of the scientists on key issues only about 37% of the public feels that GMOs are safe, and nearly 90% of the scientists feel the technology is safe. And it just points out that we need to do a much better job on, uh, on communication. And, and I think that's key. And the point I would make here is engaging with society on science is essential. I would tell you that the biggest mistake that my company made several years ago, once we had developed the technology and we had launched these products, we spent our time communicating with the, the, the farmers who were using the products, and we did not spend the time we needed directly with consumers. And that, that was a big mistake, and I wish we could have reversed it. But several years ago, we realized that was a mistake. As a company, we're engaging heavily on you know, building the trust that we need with consumers, which basically means engaging you know, in the dialogue, having the, uh, the conversation, uh, being transparent, you know, in our business operations. One of the things we do now is every one of our scientific papers is published, and you can see these. And on your chairs, you should have uh, my business card and a thumb drive. I hope you follow me on, uh, on Twitter. But on that thumb drive, I've got access to a lot of the information, a lot of the data, you know, that I've talked about so quickly here. This communication is key. And part of it is communicating to people in the way they want to get the information. And that means social media. That means, you know, videos and, and communicating directly uh, to the public. And probably I would say one of the, the, the great you know, conversations going on right now around transparency and, and, uh, and communication, you know, relies around the, the topic of food labeling. And there's a lot of confusion on, on food labeling. Should foods be labeled with GMO? What should the label be? Should it be done city by city, state by state? You know, our, our view surprises a lot of people. We, we are very supportive of voluntary labeling. And, uh, you know, we want the labeling to be, uh, to be truthful so it's not confusing to the consumer. And I think voluntary labels are key. In fact, today, if you buy a food that's been organic and labeled by the USDA, it's GMO free. Or, you know, there's private founded, you know, companies that are, are labeling the, the non-GMO project. There's literally thousands of choices, and we think that's a, a very good thing. 
We don't think, you know, city by city or state by state's the right way. You know, if we end up with a patchwork of, of 50 different state regulations in this country, it will uh, it'll be very hard on the food industry. It would be, I think, devastating to farmers to try to comply with all that, uh, that regulation. And really, I think it would confuse a lot of, uh, a lot of consumers. If we're going to label these products in that sense, they need to be labeled at the national level so that everybody understands the, uh, the rules across the board. Personally, what I like the best is the smart label. And, and right now, that's being actively pursued by the, uh, by the USDA and by the, the grocery manufacturers because you can put so much information in that QR code. You can give consumers information on where the crop was produced, how it was processed, and, uh, and uh, how it was packaged, frankly. So that's, uh, that's real key. So I'm going to conclude and just make a couple of points. First of all, you know, as I look at, uh, at the last slide here, here's the facts. Our population is going to continue to grow. That's the blue line. It flattens off at about 10 billion people by 2050. In order to achieve food security, we need to double food production. That's the red line. The good news is we have the technology, the capabilities, and the tools uh, to do that. In fact, I can tell you, I believe we can increase crop yields so dramatically that we can not only achieve food security, but that green land represents all the land we farm around the world to produce our food. We can become so proficient that we can take land out of production and restore it to, uh, to better environmental uses. So that's... Uh, what I want to leave you with, a technology that's been valuable, a technology that's been highly regulated, and I ask for your support. We know we need to have better and more open public dialogue. We need to know that we have the right capability in decision and, uh, and policy making. We want to make the right decisions for the right reasons so that these technologies and tools can continue to have benefit across agriculture and healthcare. Thank you very much.